also a good collaboration with my PhD advisor, Daniel Atiani, and Isai Sutter. So this talk is uh, closely related to what um, I've been discussed this morning, so discretization of quantum internal system. And in particular, in this talk, we want to focus on uh, von Kármán theories. So we first try to introduce the von Kármán theory for thin beams in important Newtonian forms, then discuss the numerical discretization, and then just show the uh, numerical convergence study that may convince you of the, of the quality of the discretization. So what's the difference in between a linear and a nonlinear uh, beam theory, in particular the von Kármán one, is the fact that we account for geometric and nonlinearities, and this in particular allows to describe um, uh, bifurcations for people working in uh, nonlinear dynamics or buckling for uh, structural engineers. So you can see in the picture, there is something not going quite right in, in that uh, container. So if the structure is solicited with a sufficiently high uh, compressive load, it becomes unstable. So the basic idea behind the von Kármán assumption is that the out-of-plane deflection is comparable with respect to the thickness. So we have uh, the vertical deflection, W in this slide, compared with the thickness of the beam, so H, and this is something comparable to one. So normally for thin beams, we also consider the aspect ratio, which is important. So it is the ratio in between the thickness and the length. And in the Vokaman assumption, basically we retain in the expansion terms that are comparable to this aspect ratio, but also to the uh, squared power of the aspect ratio. So probably you are more familiar with the uh, linear isotopic beams, especially in the Newtonian framework, and in particular, you can describe the axial displacement by means of a, a wave equation. So in this case, I just consider a linear isotopic beam. Sure. Uh, nothing changes if you need to consider an isotopic material, for example, composite materials that are commonly used in, uh, in aerospace applications. And then you have also the uh, vertical displacement uh, PDE, which is a Euler-Bernoulli model in which you have a, a, a basically a plasion of the uh, momentum uh, uh, distributed along the, uh, the beam. And this momentum is proportional to the curvature of the beam. So this is the case for, uh, for the linear um, isotopic beams. In this case, the two PDEs in the isotopic case are completely uncoupled. So you can solve one, you can solve the other, and you never couple those. But in von Kármán beams, these two uh, PDEs will be coupled. And the, the reason for that is that we have a, a, an axial stress that is decomposed into a membrane part, so an axial part. It is the first two times in this equation related to uh, epsilon membrane. So the M is for membrane. And a second part, which is related to the bending. So it is the curvature of the beam. And in particular, once we want to compute the stresses, you will distinguish in between uh, the membrane and the bending stressing once to compute the integral along the section and the, uh, and the momentum uh, along this section. So once you derive the equation of motion by means, for example, of, of the Hamilton principle, you will get these dynamics in which you have the first equation, which is the same as the one you saw before. But in this case, the, uh, the resultant, the axial, uh, the axial stress, uh, will depend um, linearly with respect to the, non-linearly with respect to the displacement. And then in the second equation, so the, the vertical dynamics, you have as well the, the linear contribution as before, but also this coupling term that appears because of the fact that the beam is deflecting that beam behavior. But you can also uh, derive this, this model in port Hamiltonian fashion if you select the same energy variables as, as commonly done in, in the linear case. So basically, you select the linear momentum, uh, both the axial one and the, and the vertical one, and the deformations. So both the membrane deformation and the bending deformation. And since the material is uh, isotopic and, and linear, you have a linear constitutive uh, relation in which the co-energies are basically given by the energy times a, a, a positive symmetric matrix in this case, in which we have the, the density and the compliances, both the membrane and, and bending compliances. So now the problem is that 
you can clearly see we have a coupling in between the first part, which is the membrane behavior, and the second part, which is the, the bending behavior. So if you take a look at this matrix, the, this first block on the upper side is the membrane behavior. This is the bending behavior. And then we have a coupling in between the two. It is given by uh, an interconnection, which is power preserving. And this interconnection uh, makes appear the, the vertical uh, deflection. So you need to be able to access this, this variable as well. And so in order to close the system, I just add this variable together with the, the classical energy variables. And so in order to have a final skew symmetry of the interconnection operator, I also need to consider the variational derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the vertical displacement that will be non-zero in the case in which, for example, we have a gravity potential. So all this construction is, is made for beams, just for simplicity, but you can extend this in a in a very similar fashion to plates. The only difference is that then the stresses and the, and the strains will become tensors, so it's a bit more involved, but it is exactly the same construction as, as in this case. So once you compute the energy rate, you will find out this, uh, this energy rate in which we have the, the classical linear part. So this one is related to the, to the membrane behavior. This one is related to the linear bending behavior. And then we have this uh, vertical velocity, and we have both the classical linear part given by the shear stress, but also this contribution coming from the membrane behavior. So this, uh, I'm using the L2 inner product, and in particular for the energy rate, the L2 inner product on the boundary becomes the evaluation of the function at the uh, extremities of the beam. So we can collect all these boundary conditions and ju just classify those in a, in a classical sense of Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions. For the traction, we have as Dirichlet the uh, horizontal velocity at the, at the boundary or as a Neumann boundary condition, the, the axial stress. And then for the bending, we just have either the linear classical combination in between the, uh, the momentum at the extremities and the, and the, curve, and the angle or the vertical displacement and this combination of both membrane and, and bending behavior. And these boundary conditions are basically the same in, in this paper by Poole and, and Tuxnax in 1996, in which they derived a global existence and unique, uniqueness result for the full dynamical von Karman equations. So let's move on to the numerical discretization. In this part, you will see hopefully uh, very close connections with what uh, Albert discussed in the plenary talk of this morning. So in particular, what is uh, commonly done is that since we have a linear relation, we can invert this Q operator, but this is, can, can be also done in, in a nonlinear case in which we have more complicated constitutive equation. So you just move this Q operator on the left-hand side, it becomes a, a mass matrix. And then I just, in the sequel, I will just remove this variational derivative with respect to, uh, to W because there is no uh, gravity potential. And then we have this interconnection operator that is linear in some parts, and then this uh, nasty coupling in between the membrane and, and bending behavior. So as classically done in, in finite element formulation, we introduce a, a variational formulation, a weak formulation in which we consider test functions and, and we need to consider uh, some particular uh, Hilbert spaces, in particular the H1 Hilbert space of uh, function with weak gradient and the L2 in a space. And then in this specific case, I integrate by part the first, the third, and the fourth line. And the reason uh, for that is that I do not want to uh, use H2 conforming finite elements for the bending part. So it's very common in in conforming finite elements for fin beams and plates to use complicated um, elements. But in this case, I don't want to do that. So that's the reason why I integrate by part this third and fourth line. Okay. So this weak formulation is, is such that we need to find this co-energy variable belonging to H1 and, and this one to L2, such that this one holds for all test functions in, in, in the same Hilbert spaces. If we want to just uh, take a compact formulation and we, we need to find this co-energy variable in such a space such that we have this mass be linear form, uh, this uh, JW, which is a skew symmetric bilinear form modulated by W, and this B is actually a, a vector value functional, is just a position of different functionals collecting the, mm, 
the values of the test function at the extremities of the beam. So then we move on to the mixed finite elements construction. This is also called the um, partition finite element method or mixed finite element method, but the idea behind is always the same. It's related to the work of Arnold, Falk, and Winter in 2006 on finite element exterior calculus. So the idea is that we have an Hilbert complex going from this H1 space to the L2 space, and we require some, uh, and we have a couple of requirements for mixed Galerkian approximation in which we take discrete subspaces of H1 and L2, and those two subspaces need to form a subcomplex. So once we take the derivative of the H to H1 spaces, we need to be in a subset of L2, and this is related to the uh, complex property. And also these uh, discrete spaces need to admit a bounded linear projection, P for H1 and P for L2, that commutes with the, with the derivative. And this is fundamental if you want to achieve a, a, a discretization with the optimal convergence rate possible. And so this is satisfied for a couple of uh, finite element families, the continuous Galarkin of order k and the con this continuous Galarkin of order k minus one. So it's simply the affine finite elements, so the at finite elements for the continuous Galarkin and the constant uh, discontinuous Galarkin in which we have a constant value of the function in each element in the lowest order case. And so what I, I will try to do then for the finite element choice of this, of this model is that I want to respect these two requirements for the finite element space at the linear level. So for the linear level, I'm choosing these uh, two families that respect the, the complex property for E, U, and E, Epsilon. And then for the remaining part and the nonlinear part, I would like to have something similar for the nonlinearity. So once I take the derivative of the continuous Galarkin and I also take the multiplication with the derivative on a, of another continuous Galarkin, I will be in a subspace of this continuous Galarkin of order 2k minus 2, because I need to take the derivative one time times another one because it is quadratic. So in the end, I find out this final dimensional system, which retains the same structure of the, of the infinite dimensional counterpart. So that's, that's all for the discretization. Now we move to the, just a simple uh, convergence study, just to see if the discretization works correctly or not. It is not a, a complete convergence analysis, obviously, but still important to do this. So we take a, a manufactured solution because I actually don't know any analytical solution for the von Kármán model. Together with some homogeneous boundary conditions, we can also consider variable time-dependent boundary conditions, but this is just for simplicity. I'm not actually interested in the, in the time discretization, so in this case, I just take a, a standard kank nicholson scheme, which is, in the linear case, is also symplectic and is equivalent to the implicit midpoint, so there are very good reasons to, to, to choose this one. And I want to measure the convergence by considering this discrete time space norm in which I consider the L infinity norm in the time domain over a certain Hilbert space, can be the H1 space or the L2 space. It depends on the variable I'm considering. And to compute this in a discrete fashion, I, need, I, will, I will take just the maximum value of, the, uh, of a certain Hilbert norm on the simulation instance. So once you do that and you you can implement this, for example, in, in some open source finite element libraries. I'm using uh, FireDuck in this case. You can clearly see that for the first variables, this is the, the horizontal velocity. We get exactly what we expect. So uh, uh, a convergence depending on the degree of the polynomials we are considering. So it is a convergence h to the power k in the h1 norm. Uh, same story for the axial stress, but it, this time it is a, an L2 uh, measure for the error. Uh, similar for the vertical velocity. And it is even super convergent in this case for the, um, for the bending stress. So in the case of k equal 1, we, we observe this kind of super convergence and, uh, and that's it. So that was the, the idea behind this, this talk to achieve a model and, and produce a discretization. And this is just the first step into 
Potomato uh, models in of nonlinear mechanics. It is the long way to the top, a long way to the actual nonlinear elasticity. But we can clearly see that this geometric nonlinearity is belong to the interconnection operator. It is not related to the constitutive equation. So there is a natural extension for the 2D case. The finite elements are a bit more complicated, but it is the same. And also for the numerical results, I, I basically obtain the same, the same behavior. And we, we can use this to study more complex phenomena. So that was all. Uh, I thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions. Thank you, Andrea, for the very nice presentation. Uh, we have actually, we, we, were, uh, we were rushing in time. Now we have five minutes left. So um, questions are very welcome at this stage. Or we can also go to lunch. <laughs> or we can go to lunch. Okay, thank you. thank you very much. Very interesting talk. So uh, first, maybe a comment. It's very good that you have the non-linearities in the in the interconnection operator. So I think that one can really prove that uh, Crank Nicholson or similar schemes will preserve exactly the energy. So this yeah. might be very good. Uh, and and a, a second now comment or question. So it's a bit unusual that you use this 2K order approximation for some of the variables. So I understand yeah. that you would like to have an, some sort of an exact yeah. kind of way of representing things. So did you try higher order approximations and see what really happens if you go back to k or k plus one, I would expect to get similar results, actually. Yeah, I actually uh, didn't explore the whole family of possible finite elements. Uh, it's just a, an heuristics, really, what I'm choosing here, just to kind tend to respect a complex property, but it's not in, in a linear case. It is a polynomial nonlinearity. So it's something that really doesn't exist in the finite element exterior calculus framework in which the older results are really limited to the linear case. So, yeah, it's a very interesting question. I, uh, it, it, it would be something interesting to try to just see what is really important to, to, in order to have this interconnection per operator discretized appropriately. Yes. Doesn't seem the case. So, thanks again, Andrea.